Hello, I'm Juliette Foster and welcome to Diplomacy in Dialogue, a series of shows in partnership with the German Foreign Office aimed at examining some of the biggest issues facing the international community. Well, our topic today is forgotten crises, the humanitarian issues that are no longer at the forefront in the public mind and why, as a result, the people most affected are not receiving the support they so desperately need. We'll be looking at what's causing these crises, why they're being ignored, the impact that has on people on the front line and what can be done to redress the balance. Well, to help us navigate our way through these complex questions, we've assembled a panel of experts. Let me introduce them. Joining us from Berlin is Barbara Koffler. She is the Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance at the German Foreign Office. We're also joined from Geneva by Heba Ali. Heba is a director at the New Humanitarian, an independent non-profit newsroom that reports from the heart of crises. Heba is a multimedia journalist by training. She also regularly commentates on humanitarian policy at global conferences and is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council. And Paul Ness is a senior advisor at the Norwegian Refugee Council and an expert in global humanitarian crises. The NRC is an independent humanitarian NGO which provides assistance, protection and durable solutions to refugees and internally displaced persons. Paul joins us from Oslo. Well, thanks to all of you for joining us today and we'll begin our interactive question and answer session with our panel in just a few moments. But first, let's take a look at today's topic in more depth. Now, any number of factors can trigger a humanitarian crisis, be it war, political disputes, economic instability, natural disasters or the gradually emerging consequences of climate change. At the end of 2019, an estimated 170 million people around the world were dependent on some form of humanitarian assistance. According to UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, 79.5 million people had been forcibly displaced worldwide, with 80% of them in countries affected by acute food insecurity and malnutrition. Meeting their needs will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Yet no matter how the figures stack up, what doesn't change is that most of these people are the victims of so-called forgotten crises. So the big questions, why do these disasters fall beneath the radar? Well, many factors are to blame. A lack of media and geopolitical interest as the eyes of the world drift from one crisis to another. Donor fatigue when a disaster drags on. An unwillingness or indeed reluctance on the part of those at the centre of a conflict to compromise. And the fact that victims themselves may be too far away or even culturally different for most of us to identify with, all of which conspire to create protracted crises that put some of the world's most vulnerable people at risk. Well, the German Foreign Office has identified 15 forgotten global crises that it aims to highlight in 2020. Well, these include situations in Central and South America, the crises in the African Sahel zone, incorporating Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania and Niger. It also covers the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, as well as countries affected in a vast sweep of Asia, from Afghanistan and Pakistan to Myanmar and the Philippines. So, why does one person suffering become an international emergency, resulting in global conferences, mediation efforts and vast donations, while somebody else's goes largely unnoticed. And what can be done to ensure that aid is delivered to the regions and populations that need it the most? Big questions. So let's bring in our questions. And Barbara Koffler, I'd like to start with you. Now, we all agree that humanitarian assistance should be based on need, but that isn't always the case. Why? Well, it shouldn't only be based on need. It is in our uh, duty, it is based on need. And it's, of course, depending only on the people on the ground. But in reality, of course, you, uh, you have different challenges. For example, if there are different border lines in between to reach those in need, and there are sometimes people who try to benefit from uh, the humanitarian aid, you're getting in really into trouble. So. Uh, that's that's one reason on the ground but it's based on need and another thing is of course we have to have an international cooperation on humanitarian assistance not every country can focus on the same region and the same uh, amount of countries and there is also a gap i think 
in between the coordination of the countries and the donors to really identify the crisis, all of the people in need, and really identify that and not all jump on the same crisis. So there's a gap on that also, I think. Okay, so practical issues on the ground, Heba. So, but what's your take on this? Because I know that you feel very strongly about the, the whole issue, about this, this whole principle of need, that it doesn't always work out, even if that's the intention. Well, it's just that we as journalists, and I run a team of journalists who report on humanitarian crises around the world, often see that there are plenty of places in which there is very clear need and not at all a priority among um, the, the rich countries or among um, the wider kind of apparatus that responds to crises. And I would argue um, respectfully to the commissioner, of course, that, that there are many cases in which uh, the political objectives of countries is one of the drivers of need. And we've seen in recent years, many countries, including Canada, Australia, and most recently the UK, merging their foreign affairs departments and their development departments or ministries on that recognition that in fact they want one to serve the other or they want them to be working in hand in hand. And that necessarily means that it isn't always going to be the need that is driving the decision making. And let's stay with that idea, Barbara Cobbler, this whole concept about political objectives influencing the, the amount of need, well, the, the response to need. What about the issue of impartiality, because government decisions over aid distribution are meant to be impartial, but if you've got these political factors influencing things, that doesn't necessarily stay true to the concept, does it? Well, that's impartiality is one of the key issues on humanitarian assistance. And just uh, one small sentence, we didn't merge in Germany our development ministry and the foreign affairs ministry because that keeps a little bit more of freedom and political freedom also to really concentrate on those in need and not so much on where you have an agreement uh, with other countries to Im do important also development work. So uh, yes, we still have this question on impartiality. But uh, that's one of our real principles where we try really to work on and be as neutral mm -hmm. as possible. That doesn't mean that you don't have a political view on a conflict. That's another question, but humanitarian aid as given, um, as, at least as, as much as I can tell from my department, is given to those in need and not driven by the question, do I like somebody or I am on the side of one or the other part? of the conflict. So that's another question. But it's in practical terms, it is very challenging. So I have to admit that, of course, Heba is right. That's very challenging in practice. OK, and, and Heba Ali, as, as we heard there, yes, on a practical level, it's, it is very difficult to apply the principle of impartiality. But at the same time, you do have to ask yourself, what makes one disaster more deserving of aid than another? And more specifically, how severe does a crisis have to be to get the world involved and to sit up and take notice? Well, I mean, in terms of uh, gauging need, there's an entire international humanitarian apparatus that has been established to do exactly that with very objective measures and ways of tracking how many people are in need and uh, what those needs are and so on. Um, from our side, in terms of what gets media attention and what doesn't, I would say there are probably three key factors one of them you mentioned in fact at the beginning uh is is uh relatability so are the victims of this crisis people that i can relate to uh, i as a, someone from the general public um, that can include race and ethnicity that can include proximity we saw for instance during the balkans war that there was more engagement frankly because the victims were white uh, and so europe felt much more engaged than it might otherwise uh, I'm Canadian. When the earthquake hit in Haiti in 2010, there was much more engagement from the Canadian public than uh, these kinds of crises usually get because of the proximity and the close ties that Haiti and Canada had. Um, so that's one factor. I think the other obvious one is geopolitics. And when a country is at the heart of geopolitics, and we can take Syria as an excellent example, it certainly gets much more attention because what happens there has an impact on many other countries. <clears throat> And then finally, I think, um, and this is where perhaps we in the media have a bit more of a responsibility, 
uh, I think people care more when they feel that there's something they can do about it. If it feels like it's a crisis that is, you know, inevitable and unfixable, then what's the point of engaging? And and if the crisis does have um, some entry points for improvement, and if and if we in the media can also give signs for hope or explain how the situation can be improved, I think there you have a few a few more um, entry points to get people. And that's an interesting issue, isn't it, Paul Nessa? It is those entry points because the problem that we often have with many of these crises is that some people are very responsive, yes, but a lot of people kind of switch off, back away, because they feel that perhaps a crisis doesn't really relate to them. It seems existential and they can't really connect it to their own life if they're looking at life in terms of making sure you earn enough to actually pay your gas bill to actually put food on the table. What's happening in another part of the world doesn't really figure. Well, that varies a bit, actually. Uh, it is, of course, correct that what the media conveys uh, is very determining in the interest the public gets in an issue. But we also see, as we've seen recently, for instance, around the situation in Greece, that people do get involved. People, if they just see a bit uh, are mobilized. And I think it's also for agencies like mine, the ability to tell a story and convey news that the public can relate to and make exactly those people that are forgotten out of the lens at the moment uh, are not forgotten, but we bring their stories a bit to life. Right, but one of the other problems that aid agencies often have is this perception that maybe when money is given, it doesn't necessarily reach those who it is meant to assist. Let me give you the example of Cyclone Nargis. Now, this happened in 2008 in Myanmar. You had 140,000 people who were killed in that disaster. And yet, there were allegations that the government channeled some of the aid that was given to communities from its own ethnic groups. Now, the whole point about it is that people would have given in good faith. And if there is a sense that it's not really hitting the target, that, it's been, that aid is being used for political purposes, that makes it very difficult for those on the ground to assist, but also those in your position at the top to appeal to, 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 appeal to the public for aid. Well, of course, agencies like us must be able to follow the money. But uh, you need several channels, usually, in any crisis. You have a government channel, very often from government to government. You have the United Nations and its agencies, which can often have a fair degree of autonomy. And then you have both international and local non-governmental organizations. And depending on the political situation, you should also consider uh, whom are best placed now to handle people's donations. And when it comes to private donations, I think often uh, non-governmental organizations will have a good upper hand, while often a government needs to deal with a host government and sometimes take more of a risk whether that government works as intended or not. Right, but Barbara Koffler, it must be extraordinarily or extremely frustrating that you have issues like this arising about aid not reaching those who it's meant to, to assist. It may go into, the, into other people's pockets, etc., because that risks prolonging a conflict, but more importantly, shifting the humanitarian narrative, taking it in a different direction. We should be looking at the suffering of those on the ground, but instead the focus is on the behaviour of those at the top. You, you're quite right. I think we have to look closer where the money is going. But uh, therefore, we can undertake measures. For example, we have a Center for International Peace Operations. That means civilian services, uh, where we really work on the ground uh, with people to adjust better or to, to make societies um, able to adopt to those humanitarian assistance. And on the other side, I think uh, one thing we didn't talk until now is uh, forecast uh, the prediction of crisis should be in a, in a more in the focus because then you can with smaller amounts of money reach more directly the people who might be in need or who are not in need if you do something in advance. Uh, an example for me is what we did in Bangladesh um, with forecasted uh, crisis, flood crisis where you could in advance give money to the people directly 
to evacuate uh, and you don't have such a big hassle and such a big amount of money after the crisis. So maybe we, we have instruments where we should look in closer to really reach the people. Right, and that's an interesting point which leads to my next question. In fact, I want to put this question to all of you. It is the point at which governments and agencies should intervene. In other words, do you intervene in a country before a crisis happens or after? Because there is the danger that it could be construed as political, that basically you're using aid as a cover for a wider political objective. Can I put that question first to Paul and then uh, Barbara, if you can take it on, and then Heber? It is always a risk that you may be seen as having a political agenda in addition to your humanitarian one. And that's why imperative, as we mentioned previously, uh, the issue of impartiality and neutrality, particularly when it comes to conflict and warring parties. At the same time, as you just mentioned, the story from Bangladesh is a very good example of when you can be there early, particularly in relation, for instance, to climate change issues, then it is so much uh, cheaper to do prevention than to repair something afterwards and to, the build, to build the resilience of populations and groups that are particularly vulnerable to these issues. Uh, and then through your behavior, you have to make sure that you maintain your impartiality and your neutrality, and it's not seen as playing a political game here. Okay, and Barbell? Yeah, I, I would agree to the, what Paul said. Um, it's of course a challenge to be on a one kind in a diplomatic or political uh, conversation with other countries and uh, try to avoid conflicts or stop crises and conflicts if they are uh, political conflicts, not climate change ones, uh, through diplomatic measures and diplomatic issues. And on the other hand, you are an actor or you are the donor in humanitarian assistance. There is always a challenge in between, but we have to make clear that our humanitarian assistance is given to those in need impartially and not depending on if we like uh, the decisions of a certain government or uh, a certain group of people. So that is a challenge, a, co a continuously ongoing challenge. And on the other hand, uh, I just want to underline again, if we do something already in advance to show countries, to show people that there is a benefit in avoiding crisis and do something also invest, for example, in mediation after a crisis, after a crisis, after a conflict, do more in those so-called soft, soft skills. I think we could avoid a lot of crises in advance and we could gain also respect on that because you see you try to be a neutral um, player in between conflict parties. So this mediation aspect, as I was just mentioning, our Center for International Peace Operation is working on, um, I think it's, it's something we should focus on also. Okay, and finally, Heather, your response to that point. Well, I would certainly note uh, the obvious, which is that many foreign interventions, and in the most notable and obvious is the United States, um, in parts of the Middle East and around Central America, around the world, really, have had disastrous uh, and long-lasting consequences. So certainly um, intervention for the wrong reasons does fit many of the descriptions that you that you made off the top. Um, I think there there will absolutely, as the commissioner was saying, be a need for early intervention, uh, simply because the current pace of crises is so high and so fast that responding after the fact will, you know, the system has reached its limits and will not be able to, as we saw in the case of COVID, as we will see in the case of. Uh, climate change, there will be too many crises to address, and that will lead to a lot of suffering. And so if you do want to get up ahead of that curve, you will need to act early to prevent them, but to do so in a way, if, if those are your genuine intentions, that don't then um, evoke the, the, uh, the kind of bad um, decisions and interventions of the past. And I think one way of doing that is rather than intervening yourself to, as we have seen in our reporting, um, uh, work through local partners is that's that's a conversation that is happening across the humanitarian assistance sector to say how uh, can the sector work more effectively in supporting local actors who are already on the ground and who are already doing this work rather than themselves intervening so that might be 
um, an opening in which this kind of early intervention could take place without having all of the negative um, perceptions and and potential consequences of, of some of what we've seen. Okay, well, let's break off now for a few moments to get the thoughts of the general public. Now, we asked people who they thought was, the, was most to blame for these crises being ignored. Here's what they had to say. I think maybe it's the medias, because they don't talk about it, and uh, the governments of our countries, because they can, make fa they can do things to make it better, but they don't do it because of the covid because uh, yeah we don't uh, we are so uh, in uh, this crisis of covid and we forgot uh, all the other crises we all look at the the media every day you know we look at uh, you know our lo you know, regional or local news broadcasters and you know corona is a, is the number one topic and everything else just gets put to the side i don't know why but uh, the people want to just to look at uh, uh, himself, uh, myself, me, me too. Uh, I look at in the first time me, and uh, when I have my comfort, my my house, my Netflix, or ah, uh, right now I can't uh, look uh, what happened in the other country. Or, I think me, I'm I have a responsibility, the, my friend, but the society also. Maybe because we don't speak a lot about this, and uh, in at school, for example, I we don't have a, a subject about that. With this whole COVID-19 pandemic, it's easily to forget uh, those uh, pandemics, those crises in the in those areas because uh, health comes first. So we have to f focus on this. We could speak about international responsibility to help the people that is more into trouble, but mainly it's the, the same nation that is just responsible of taking more care about humanitarian problems than others. So it's just a focus of the government itself. Okay, the thoughts there of the general public. Let's pick up on some of the key points. Uh, Heba, I want to start with you because the, the dominant theme which came out there was that people said that these crises were not being covered because the emphasis was on COVID-19. Also, people have become very self-centred because they tend to watch Netflix and also a problem with education because these crises are not re referenced in school. But let's bring it back to something a bit more down to earth, so to speak. You and I have both worked in news organisations and we know that editors tend to respond to a story if it's sexy. In other words, it has to have elements that appeal to our human instincts and which grab the attention. The reality is that as long as that rule prevails, then it's pretty obvious that some crises will be covered, but others will be kicked into the rough. They will be ignored. Is that fair? Yes, I think it's certainly the case that we, we in the news industry, uh, there was this expression, if it bleeds, it leads. And... Um, you know, we cannot deny the fact that there's a certain, you know, the elements that were taught in journalism school about what makes a good story are the drama, the, the tension, etc. Um, I think that we're starting to see a pushback against that in the news industry. I attended a conference a few years ago um, all around uh, peace building and how we can we should be reporting about peace in the same way that we report about conflict, because, in fact, we in the media are um, giving an impression that these conflicts are inevitable because we put so much focus on them. And we have the power to kind of rewrite that narrative. And yes, certainly uh, readers will find stories that are dramatic and, and, um, and so on less, uh, or sorry, more compelling. Um, but that's up to us to shape the narrative. I mean, we just have to do our job well. And if we do our job well, any story becomes interesting. And it's uh, more a choice of where do we put our energy and our focus? And then how do we tell that story in a way that has compelling human elements and, and that tells a kind of universal story that everyone can relate to. Um, are forgotten crises unsexy? Arguably, uh, in the traditional definition, yes. But again, I think the consumer or the reader gets used to whatever we in the media feed them. And if they, if, you know, all we feed them is the kind of bang, bang, um, or the or the kind of uh, sexy stories in the traditional definition, that's what they get used to. And we need to reteach ourselves to appreciate a different kind of story 
and um, a different focus in our in what we consume. And and again, I think that can be that can be learned. Uh, we we've just um, in fact launched an entire package of stories around uh, peace building, and we called it Beyond the Bang Bang reporting from the front lines of peace to say that actually there are stories beyond the the kind of sexy headlines that you might read. And we just need to get used to, as they say, if you build it, they will come. We, we need to get used to um, giving value to that. Other sure. I, mean, I want to look at the idea of the pushback a little bit later on, but let's stick with this idea about stories being sexy, about, that, about the, the, the amount of mileage that goes into them. Because look, there is the other element and that is bias because there are some news editors who take the view that look, when you have a humanitarian crisis in somewhere like Europe or indeed Latin America, it's worth covering because we're talking about very rich developed societies. Whereas if you're going to a conflict somewhere in Africa, maybe it's ignored because there is a sense that, well, you know, conflict, political instability, famine, it's synonymous with some African countries. So what's the point? Because people are getting fed up of hearing about it. It's a rather flippant way of describing things. But unfortunately, that is the mindset of some news editors, isn't it? Well, yes, but um, people are getting tired of hearing about it, probably because we haven't told the story in a very compelling way. And if I mean, that's on us again to find more interesting ways to tell the story. And, and I come back to this point about a universal narrative, because when people end up in a situation where they say, well, that's going on. Oh, those, uh, as you kind of put it, those Africans are killing each other. That's because we have done a poor job of describing what's happening there to make it seem like it's so different than what happens everywhere else. And what is at the heart of every single crisis usually is power and um, power dynamics, power abuse, resources. Some people have it, some people don't. Um, when you When you start to really get at the heart of those issues, uh, then you see that actually the people at the heart of these crises are not so different than you and I. And it's on, again, on us to uh, tell those stories in a way that allow people to relate to the people at the heart of these crises. That's one thing. I think the other thing is that uh, when, we, when we talk about, um, you know, these people over there are X, Y, and Z, uh, we are, ex we are um, painting... Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. I'll come sure. back. Okay, I, mean, uh, let, I, I think we've got the sense, though, of, of what you're getting out there. But look, Boba Koffler, yes, there, there may well be a failure on the part of, of the media in terms of how it tells the stories, but then it, it begs the much bigger question about how many disputes have dragged on needlessly, how many people have suffered precisely because of this air of indifference that the media may itself have been culpable in, in nurturing and therefore, doesn't that represent a failure of humanitarian responsibility if people are just switching off because they don't really get a sense of context and perhaps why they have to care about these crises? I don't know if I only would blame the media because uh, as some of the viewers on the ground were saying, um, it's all of us a little bit and how we are structured as human beings uh, as if a conflict is far away you might not be so interested so it's an internal structure maybe of all of us but what mm. Ali was uh, Heba was saying um, is for me quite quite interesting because what I'm missing is that um, we are talking on a long-term story you just don't, you don't jump in in a conflict give some humanitarian assistance and then everything is solved and fine Humanitarian assistance can't solve the conflict. Also, the media can't solve the conflict. So there are different processes ongoing, and we have to have a political process which has to be accompanied by the expertise and by uh, the media, and also a humanitarian process. And if people don't hear uh, from both from from the responsibles on the ground, from politicians, from the media, uh, what is really ongoing? What is the work which is tried where are the limitations maybe also of humanitarian assistance and where are the benefits and where are the problems solved uh, then they get um, maybe not interested anymore in listening to the conflict but if you tell this long-term story um, I, I'm sure that people are willing to support and understand why the conflict maybe is not solved so easily, but where the benefits for the humanitarian assistance are. So what, what Heber was mentioning, really to describe where, where the whole story is, not only jump on a, a moment. 
uh, on a momentum. That's, I think, something we have to learn. If we look, for example, quite a an, 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 uh, recent uh, debate, two months ago, this incredible explosion in Beirut was taking place. The whole media was focused on that area, rightly focused on that. But what's ongoing, the humanitarian uh, conflict which is ongoing now and where we all have to work on and where a lot of promises were made from the international community and so on and so on, we don't really do this follow-up and we don't present it to the people. So, of course, they don't understand the question maybe where the money is gone, does it really help somebody on the ground. So we have to do this long-term, um, yes, story. Mm. Uh, Paul, Paul Ness, let me pick... I would absolutely let, let, agree. Sorry, did you want to say something, Happy? Please do, do, do go in. Do. I was just going to say I absolutely agree with that because I think it's a lot harder for someone to be interested in a topic that they don't understand whatsoever. And once they have a kind of basis of um, who's who, what is this about, etc., then it becomes a lot easier to take the reader, in this case, to the next level of uh, information. And, and so, so long as it is so far away from them that they don't know anything about it, it's really hard to generate any interest. But if you can sustain coverage of something over time and come back to that same story over and over, then you see that people can start to make sense of it. And that's when they can start to connect with it emotionally. And that's what we're trying to do at the New Humanitarian in, in kind of not just parachuting into a story in the way that uh, mainstream media tend to do because of the business model and the resource mm. constraints, but to be committed to covering these forgotten crises over time, over and over and over until people have enough of a foundation of understanding that they can then get connected to the, the, the people. And I want to bring in Paul Nesser because look, that, that expression that we heard from, from, from both Hebe and from Barbell about jumping in a story on the moment because when people, when we do jump in as the media and you get this powerful response from the public, it is endearing. I guess the, the thing, though, is to sustain it. Because let me take the example of Alan Kurdi. Now, he was a Syrian boy whose body was washed up on the Turkish beach. It was a horrific moment, but it also encouraged people to donate, donate to the family and to the charities that were trying to work with Syrian refugees. But I guess the problem there is that because people are responding to something horrific, they feel, well, OK, then, I've given money, I've done my bit, so you switch off. And I guess that, yes, you can carry on telling the story, but if people have switched off on that moment, the rest of the narrative is lost. But this is also very much related to politics, which I think we haven't touched enough on. Uh, media interest is very often linked to political interest. And if the political interest dies, as it has with the situation in Greece and Moria camp until very recently. Nothing has happened. Pub media interests vanish and public interests dry out. We have a very interesting example right now with the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh and neighboring Armenia and Azerbaijan, where we see we may get a hot conflict. Uh, we had that conflict uh, 15 years ago. But we never concluded the peace negotiations. They've stalled for 10 years. There has not been political initiatives. And we have not worked internationally to get Russia and Turkey and the others involved to find a solution. And that is very parallel to very many ongoing conflicts. Uh, we don't see refugees being able to go back home in so many places because the conflicts have been simmering at low or uh, a bit of a conflict for a long time, a bit hasn't been solved. And we see very little political in initiative to do that solving. We're back to sort of national sovereignty, don't meddle in others' affairs. And we see a Europe, we see other countries withdrawing from the negotiation tables around the world. And when, again, political interest uh, goes down, media interest goes down and public understanding of knowledge goes down. And of course, it also contributes that when you have so many ongoing uh, conflicts, it's a limit to what the public can absorb. And of course, you get motivated also as the public when you see some solutions, when you see some progress. And that's been one of our major concerns and one of the big reasons, I think, for these 
protracted, neglected crisis we have around the world, we're not paying political attention. Mm. And, and, and just, just picking up on the point of politics, because yes, we're looking at politics in terms of the geopolitics, the game playing amongst uh, the various powers that be. And again, I want Barbell and Heber to respond to this. It's also the politics of language in the media, reflecting that relationship between the, the media and, and government officials. The fact, for example, that if we take the crisis in the Mediterranean, we had people referenced as refugees. And then as more of them took, undertook these dangerous journeys, they moved from being refugees to migrants, from being migrants to being economic refugees, from being economic refugees to a burden shifted around. One country isn't stepping up to the plate, others should do it. This is also quite dangerous in terms of resolving those conflicts and indeed in terms of how the public themselves reviews these things. There have, there have been, been certain, certain cases, cases in, in which, which uh, the... Uh, arrival of refugees has either been needed because the country didn't have enough workforce or has been an economic boom because of uh, even, uh, I can take Jordan as an example, where an influx of aid workers coming to conferences and staying in hotels and so on has stimulated the economy. And so again, uh, which narrative are you choosing to tell makes a big difference in, in how these issues are then received by the public. Paul, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. And again, I'd, I'd also like Heber to respond too, because this is the rise of alternative media voices. Do you feel that perhaps these crises, as, as we seem to be enveloped in more of them, it's actually boosted this desire for these alternative media voices? And more importantly, have they now become an unofficial part of the wider humanitarian effort? So for organisations like yours, Paul, do these alternative voices aid you in terms of getting the message across to the public, telling them you need to be engaged and this is why? Yes, I think they do. I think we see more and more people who are the victims of these conflicts, who are themselves displaced, are using iPhones and uh, other media to tell stories, to convey the message. And we also fortunately see from time to time larger media picking this up, that uh, it's no longer the commentator, but the person affected him or herself that tells the story. So they are definitely bringing uh, voices to the debate. And then, of course, again, we need public to be more aware but also politicians not to define this as something that's outside our sphere of interest. If we're related to the just debate about refugees and migrants, uh, too much abdication from what's happening, but we also see when voices are coming through, it really helps. And what we've seen in my country, and I think many countries in Europe now, is the voices of the people on Moria camp, on Lesbos, the Greek island, uh, is being carried forward. Uh, both by the fire, but also by the people themselves, and people are becoming engaged. And they do want to hear that stories from the people themselves. And for us as humanitarians, we're very excited when that actually happens and we see people responding. Which, Heba, from your perspective, must be very good news because it means that in some ways you could perhaps be breaking the stranglehold of conventional media. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think... Part of the reason we're seeing people speaking for themselves is the evolution of technology and the information landscape around the world, but also a reflection of the fact that mainstream media was not telling their stories, probably in a way that they found satisfying. I mean, we did at the New Humanitarian a survey of our uh, readers uh, who are policymakers and practitioners in humanitarian response, and more than two-thirds of them, oh, sorry, nearly two-thirds of them said that uh, mainstream media coverage of humanitarian crises was insufficient both in quality and in quantity. And when we've asked or surveyed about this in the past, we've heard words like uh, describing mainstream media coverage of crises as sporadic, as selective, as simplistic, as partial. So there are many failings in how the mainstream media have covered crises, and that is largely linked to the business model, which we haven't really talked about. But, you know, the retreat of media from international uh, coverage has been directly linked to uh, moving online, changes in advertising revenue that has forced a lot of budget cuts. And um, and so that is leaving the kind of the job to either the people themselves, which I think is a very good trend. Um, and although it changes the role, I think, of the journalist, 
or to uh, what we might call specialist or alternative media. I mean, we are dedicated to covering these kinds of issues. There were a number of others that popped up in an attempt to do so. I, I think of News Deeply, for instance, um, The Correspondent, uh, and others, but again, they all face this this business model challenge. In other words, this kind of journalism is very hard to fund, and so many simply don't do it. And that's why we end up in a situation uh, like this, where parts of the world have stories that just go untold. And I think it's a very positive, as I say, um, uh, evolution that now people don't have to wait for the media to come tell their stories. They can tell them to the world for themselves, but it means that we then have a responsibility to kind of make sense of all these alternative narratives or all these um, citizen journalists or, or uh, voices from the ground that we might hear because, again, if we take it back to trying to uh, get wider interest around the world, um, someone needs to kind of connect the dots. And I think that then becomes... Sure. And, uh, let's push this a little bit further along because what what Heather was was basically saying there, Barbell, is that, yes, you know, conventional media, because it has seen it is seen to have failed, it's effectively opening up the space for these alternative voices to actually get the story across, to tell people what is going on. And these voices are more authentic, perhaps, because they're coming from some of the people who are directly impacted. Does this now mean that communication is part of the humanitarian package and that perhaps it has to be redefined, that package, to incorporate these new trends in communication? Because obviously you tend to benefit from that. <coughs> You're quite right. We tend to benefit from that information or from those sources of information we didn't have before. So um, what we can learn out of that is that we have to listen more carefully what the people on the ground are saying, what they're really describing at their problem, and where we then have to rethink, does that really fit to what we are able to offer and uh, able to give, and how can we bring that better in a, together, working together? So that's also, I think, part of the whole debate on uh, including local knowledge in humanitarian assistance, um, working with local people on the ground, uh, working with local organizations then on the ground, and uh, doing this localization moment uh, or using that moment more. So that can have a great impact on, on humanitarian assistance. And as a whole, in, in having awareness on those topics um, of the so-called forgotten crisis. So we are trying here in the ministry to um, all, always try to promote those forgotten crises through the help of NGOs and, uh, uh, and various uh, organizations in Germany with their connections to other countries. So those new sources of information might, might help us to be better and be more precise and maybe more effective in the future. And, and uh, Paul, just to, to take it to you, because look, we have been looking at the politics of this, we have been looking at the quality of the storytelling, etc. But it still comes back to finding a balance, if you like, between not overdoing the coverage, the media, so that it's so relentless, it switches people off, and keeping the public interested. How do you think those new voices will help to give us that sense of balance? Maybe it's also a generational thing that we see younger people being much more involved in hearing each other's voices. Uh, a much more democratic, in a way, sense of communicating, where you listen to a broader spectrum of voices, whereas those of us that are a bit older tend to uh, listen to the commentator we've always heard. So I think as humanitarians, one of our jobs, too, is to be the facilitator, the enabler of those voices. We have sometimes also been a bit coming to the field and being good charity people. But we so often hear, particularly when we work in neglected situations, that can you please let my voice be heard? Can you please let us tell our story? And if we can contribute to that by promoting more of those stories, we can also reach uh, a broader public and particularly a younger one that's more open to hearing about it. OK, then. Well, it's time now to... Can I just add please, go on. that... Sorry. To... To jump in, there, there was a reference in some of the video clips that you showed of uh, people saying COVID has overwhelmed all the news and so e the, these crises are even more forgotten, which is absolutely true. But to your question around, you know, people just switching off, I think we have a real opportunity now in that COVID has woken up the entire world to what it feels like to live in a crisis. 
And so suddenly that whole question of relatability, um, you know, we've got something to work with now. And um, our hope is that uh, this encourages people to be more interested and engaged in other crises around the world because they understand now the, the relevance of crises, they understand the importance of responding well to those crises, and they feel much more personally implicated. And that's an opportunity for us to use. And if anything, at the New Humanitarian, in our coverage of um, forgotten crises in Burkina Faso or in Central African Republic, actually COVID has been an entry point because people are interested in what's happening with COVID. And so we can say, well, you know, COVID is affecting this country and it is one of many problems to affect this country. And here are those other problems. And so I, I do think we have an opportunity and it's up to us to kind of um, use this moment to get people more interested in, okay, in these so the one leading on from the other. But it's now that point where we can hear from someone who's currently living and indeed working in one of these crisis zones as we speak to an aid worker on the front line. Leandro Salazar is an education specialist for NORCAP and is currently in Bamako in Mali. And he sent us this report describing what conditions there are like. The security situation continues to worsen with attacks against civilians in center and northern Mali. Violence has displaced more than 400,000 people and more than 4 million are in need of humanitarian assistance. This number has doubled since 2019. Children are particularly impacted by violence as 1,200 schools are currently closed due to attacks and threats against teachers, educational personnel. On top of this, COVID-19 has had a double impact health and socioeconomic impact with loss of income at driving this place into hunger and homelessness. Okay, that was the aid worker Leandro Salazar talking to us from Bamako in Mali. Paul Nessa, he, what he was looking at was the conditions on the ground, but it's, you sh we need to remember that these are not just the conditions that people in that neck of the woods are having to live in, he also has to live there as well. So he too is in danger. Do you think that people really appreciate the degree of danger that aid workers carry with them? It's, it's a shared risk. I, think we, I don't think people really know how dangerous it has become uh, in many parts of the world to be an aid worker. The number of kidnappings, the number of threats, and not least the number of killings have increased significantly in recent years. And very often at the front line of all humanitarian assistance in crisis are our national staff. For us as refugee, very often refugees themselves or people living in the area hosting them, they are there in the front line, they are there taking the risk and they are the ones that come sometimes pay the ultimate price for wanting to help others. Is that risk greater if you are a national of that country or if you are from another country and you have come in to help? In some places you are particularly uh, vulnerable as an international, but that usually means that the national internationals don't go there. And so the national ones, yes, they end up doing that instead. Typical example can be Syria, where international agency have been working, but it's very, been very hard in most parts of the country. And so the people who actually have ended up delivering are the nationals, the Syrians themselves. And Barbara Koffler, despite the risks, there are people who are so committed, they will still go along because they want to make a difference. And broadening things out, I know that what Germany does is, is, is identical to Norway in that you compile a list of, of humanitarian crises in the world. Now, uh, the Norwegian Council, they have a list of the 10 most neglected displacement crises. In Germany, it's 15. What I want to know is, why do you do this? Why is it somehow relevant? The first thing is this list is not a German invention. It's a, a, a list from the European Commission. So we try to be along with other countries and point out that there are still ongoing crises which are not solved at the moment, uh, but not in the focus anymore. We have an, an, um, a program that's about hashtag forgotten crisis 
uh, where we try to gain um, people to engage also in those areas and in those crises which are not constantly reported in uh, mainstream media. So um, it's important for us because on the one hand, we really see the need of the people in those crises. On the other hand, of course, we also have to tell our taxpayers that a third of the humanitarian uh, assistance we are giving is going to countries where, there may be, where, where the, the public maybe is not so much informed why it is, why it is needed. So we have uh, to, to make clear uh, what we are doing there and, and why we are doing it. And uh, of course, in, in, in those ongoing conflicts, it, it's mostly it's ongoing conflicts, conflicts by decades. If you look to Central America, if you look to Colombia, if you look to the refugee uh, issues in uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, those are ongoing conflicts and ongoing situations. And we want to make clear that we have to stay there and we have to work constantly in those areas. Um, and that's what we're trying with our engagement also as the ministry and with a lot of, of civil society organizations uh, on board and, and with their support in that. Okay, Paul Nessa, let, let's, uh, I guess that the point has to be that, okay, I, I understand why you focus on specific countries, but it's, again, it's the perception, the worry that you are potentially worsening the plight of vulnerable citizens elsewhere because a country is not on your list. Is that a concern that you have? No, not really, because we have the countries on our list that are neglected, that are the bottom on the bottom of this list of attention that places get. And, uh, you know, a country, like, no, uh, an organization like the Norwegian Refugee Council, we work in more than 30 countries. And the common denominator is that there is too little assistance available generally. And we're very concerned now that this is going to go down next year because uh, donor countries are struggling with their uh, economies with COVID-19. But of course, the countries where we work are struggling so much more, particularly refugees themselves. And so we really find it a dilemma that when we focus on one country, the others are forgotten. The dilemma is that uh, the most neglected are always there needing more attention. Okay, and Barbara Koffler, given that, what does the strategy of anticipatory involvement bring to the table? Because I know that that's something which Germany has, uh, well, is active in promoting, but how does it work in very brief terms? And how do you think it actually incentivizes humanitarian actors to undertake new levels of preparedness in disaster management, more important as well, given that donors are actually under budgetary constraints and the politics that goes with that? Well, very brief. Uh, to bring, first of all, actors together and uh, not uh, that one is only exclusively doing a forecast of a critical situation, but bringing all the actors from the ground together uh, in forecasting and then developing strategies, how you really can work together uh, in, uh, in advance before a crisis is happening. You have a lot of uh, nowadays with new technologies possibilities, especially if it comes to natural crisis. It's a little bit uh, more challenging if it's a political uh, driven uh, crisis, uh, crisis. But if it's a natural uh, catastrophe, there's a lot of uh, forecasting you can do and you can do in advance things. And because Paul was mentioning, of course, we have a lack of money on hum in, in, in humanitarian assistance. That's totally true. And this gap is growing. So it's even more important to do forecasting because then you can save money and do something in advance to help the people so they don't suffer so, suffer so much. But on the other hand, you can use that money you are sparing for other uh, conflicts and for other uh, needs. Uh, and, and therefore, it's also important to do more in order to... to uh, uh, engage more in forecasting. Mm. I mean, look, this is a big subject and I'm conscious that there's so much ground to cover. So in the time available, because uh, this really embraces all of these themes, it's really the poll that we have been running all this week. In fact, it's a poll on Twitter and we've been asking the public the following question. Why do you think some major humanitarian crises are ignored? We gave them quite a few options. Here they are. Lack of media attention, competing political interests, general public uninterested or indeed other global events. We've got the results. Here they are. 
38% of those who responded said that competing political interests were to blame. 28% said it was a lack of media attention. 22% said that the public were uninterested, while 12% said that other global events were responsible. I want to start out by getting a general reaction of everybody to those poll results. Starting first with you, Heber, how do you feel about the numbers and how they've played out? Well, there's a direct correlation between the public being uninterested and a lack of media attention. So I can see those two going hand in hand. Um, but for the competing uh, political interests, I would, I would, uh, it doesn't shock me at all. I think what is likely to change now and the kind of um, bigger picture in all of this, and, and the commissioner was touching on it a little bit just now, is that we are in a world in which crises are going to become more frequent, more severe, longer lasting. And climate change is the best example of that it is going to hit everyone hard and we're going to have a situation like COVID in which the entire world is in crisis but at an even bigger scale. And so um, you're going to have more and more forgotten crises because there's going to be more and more crises in general. And if you want to kind of uh, address this wider issue, the, the, um, the crisis should become the political priority in the sense that, uh, you know, there are better ways of functioning both uh, globally that would allow for fewer conflicts, uh, crises to take place. And that's, um, as, as the commissioner was saying, you know, uh, why are conflicts happening in the first place? Who's to blame for that, et cetera. Um, and then there's a better way in which the aid sector can function as well, because knowing that there are going to be more and more crises, to be um, kind of approaching crises with this, this Band-Aid solution as, as um, a kind of normal way of behaving when it's clear that the needs are going to be so much bigger than, than what the humanitarian assistance sector can do, you know, can this be turned upside down and can a better way be, be found? So one of the things we're doing at the New Humanitarian is a series called Rethinking Humanitarianism, which is really to say, you know, the current system is at its limits. Um, operationally, financially, ethically, even, is there a way of imagining a better, a okay. better system let, that let, would not let, only lead to fewer crises? Sure. But also to let me jump in to get the reaction of our, of our other guests to this poll. I, I'd like to start with you, Paul, and then Barbell. Uh, well, I think it was interesting that competing political interest came so high up, and I think it's a clear message to the ministry in um, Berlin that uh, foreign ministries need to train their other government uh, participants or domestic government agencies to remind them about the world also beyond the European Union is so important for our future. And COVID-19 is such a good example that uh, when you make uh, at home prevention more important than global prevention, you may sometime a problem down the road. So we aren't all we aren't safe ourselves before everybody are safe, and that goes for so many crisis issues. So remind your public, remind your other uh, ministries that don't forget the foreign aspect of what we're dealing with, so that we can give people a more comprehensive picture, and they're not all competing with each okay. other. Okay, and Barbara, if you could respond very briefly to those poll results, because I also want to uh, continue with the social media theme, as we have had some questions from our viewers, which I'd like you to address, Barbara. As brief as I can be, I couldn't agree more to what Paul was saying, because what occurred to my mind when I see the polls was that we still have a separation in our mindset of interior politics and foreign politics. And we have to understand that all those uh, issues which are foreign political issues are also issues in our internal politics. Uh, climate change was m mentioned. Pandemics like COVID-19 you could mention. You could mention the whole issue on refugees. You can mention, of course, supply chains in the economic fields. Uh, so there are so many things where you can't do this uh, working in political boxes, interior and foreign affairs anymore. You have to understand that it's interlinked and you have to uh, promote that not only in the government, but there also, of course, but also in the public. Okay, let me jump in here because I do want to continue with social media and taking some questions that have been coming to us via Twitter and Facebook. So let's start with this one here, which I want to direct to Barbell and Paul, but with Paul answering first. 
There are so many issues around the globe. What are some direct actions that governments and humanitarian organisations can take to raise more awareness for forgotten crises? So, Paul, you first and then Barbell. Tell their story and demand that those that are listening tell their politicians to do something about it. OK, and Barbell. So I can't say now that politicians should do something because I'm a politician. <laughs> Hypothetically, what should politicians do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, you're quite right. We have to talk about it and we have to make it a political issue. We have to make those crises a political issue and talk in any possibility or any chance we've got to talk about it. And we really have to come up again with our own uh, initiative. I just uh, say that another time we've been here now, uh, we've, we've launched in our ministry a few years ago. We have to uh, revitalize that and really talk about all those forgotten crisis, but also about maybe what we did and which effect it had for, to the people on the ground. I think we have to talk more what our what our support or our assistance uh, is leading to so people can understand why we are doing it. So we have to talk more. About okay, then I think this is a question which uh, was, is really, uh, well, Haber will, will probably feel quite comfortable answering this one. The news media should cover these issues more. I haven't heard of many of these crises. What needs to change? Heba. Well, I mentioned earlier, the reason the news media don't cover these crises is largely due to financial reasons. They have had to make budget cuts. The first thing to go is the International Bureau. So we need to reimagine a model for media that works in the current era. And my view is that if you want public service media in the same way that you have public service education and public service health, it does require some funding from government, from foundations, from readers to support uh, the, the media and, and the news that they want to consume in the world. So fixing the business model is, is point one. OK, then we're going to have to leave it there. But that, it, that is it from us. A very big thank you to our guests. A reminder, they are Barbell Koffler, who is the Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance at the German Foreign Office. Thank you so much. Heba Ali, who's director at the non-profit newsroom New Humanitarian. Many thanks to you. And Paul Ness, senior advisor at the Norwegian Refugee Council. Thank you for your contribution. And thank you too for all your time and for watching us. We'll see you again soon on the next Diplomacy in Dialogue.